I don't consider it a, co- a coincidence as much they were at the right time and the right place for that to happen. I agree. I mean, I, I, that's the whole point. I mean, how can I say it? That, you know, there was a show on TV where they went on cable where they were out, you know, beating the brush looking for Bigfoot. Well, Bigfoot was in the area. Undoubtedly, the Bigfoot is not going to be in the area long. Uh, the, the the point is, you're any cryptic or any type of thing, you're going to run across it accidentally. Even if you're out bear hunting, okay, you're you're not just if you're out looking for a bear. The odds are f- hard to find a bear. If you're not really looking, you find a bear. I mean, it's it's, it's as simple as that. But a lot of these people just assume, oh, I'm going to spend the weekend. I'm going to go out and 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 find a Bigfoot. Then they get very disappointed. Well, I wonder why. You just can't approach it that way. It just doesn't work that way. I think the first thing you've got to do is go to an area where there's some evidence of where they might uh, be more prominent at. And I've actually written one of my books, I think, is just about the uh, what I call the habituation method. It had to do more with uh, locating a a nice wooded area with a a stream of water. Had to have a water source nearby. Had to be connected like a green belt. And there were certain other factors, too. So the other thing, too, of course, is looking for something like stick structures that looked a little um, non-natural. In other words, something that might have been put together artificially or by humans or or it could have been by the Bigfoot, but you want to look for something like that. For instance, if you're looking on the ground or you see a glyph, if you see sticks, for instance, to make a triangle, and you lay it one stick on top of the other before in the triangle, well, that could it's possible it might have fell that way. However, what's even more convincing is you take the same three sticks and you lay them in such a way where they're interlaced with each other. In other words, they didn't, they couldn't fall that way. They had to actually, you had to pick up one and stick it underneath the other for it to have that effect. Well, that's more convincing right there. So if you can find stick structures that actually have that kind of pattern or interlace like that, then you know it's more intelligent, intelligently designed and probably put there by some kind of cryptid. But how do we know that, too, some areas that are people go on repeatedly looking for Bigfoot and they see these these structures or, you know, stick structures or whatever. How do we know that some group of people just, you know, for their hobby, making fun of Bigfooters, go out and create these? Well, you don't know exactly. However, if you take an area that's extremely remote or hard to get to and you just happen to get up in there. And, for instance, maybe it's an area you just went to a week early or something, and there's a time factor where there's there's no possibility that someone would have been out there. That was the same kind of case with footprints, for instance, at uh, Bumping Lake, that late in October, especially when the weather was really cold, and you know how cold our weather is right now here in Washington, um, people came up there on a Friday, and the water... It was very low on Pumping Lake, and we didn't see any of these footprints that were along the the shoreline area because it's mainly mud. And they came out there the next day, and there were like hundreds, if not a couple of thousand footprints all over. And they weren't just from one person that looked like. It looked like from a, from several different people because the, the size of the footprints were different. And some of the footprints actually had more of the characteristics that looked like the Bigfoot, which is the uh, what they call the the uh, tarsal break in the middle. In other words, the, pre- the it pushes it has a joint in the middle of their foot where it pushes down into the mud on one side and on the other at the heel area. But there's a there's a cavity up in the middle close to the ground where it doesn't push in. So we saw those and did a lot, you know, did a number of foot castings because of it. But the bizarre thing about it was accompanied by human footprints, too. And who's going to be out there, like, walking around barefooted when it's, like, 32 degrees? 
I don't know and anybody. Doing it but... in the middle of the night. Now, Bumping Lake's been known for having some very bizarre activity. So it's it's another important area of research that we're uh, that we continue to go up to that area. Interesting. Some what uh, what type of interesting things is going on around the lake? For the people who don't know, you know, I don't know. Uh, how about James doesn't know? How about the listeners? What type of strange things are going on? There is that is the same area where the first of all the ley line goes through there. The same one, same kind that goes through Crater Lake, and that's also the place where we've had the reports of people seeing portals opening up and things like that. So there you go. You have the possibility of something coming out. Possibly in the middle of the night, walking around, going back through it. But it's also an area where I have taken dozens of pictures of driving through that area and finding unbelievable structures of all sorts of geometric patterns of the uh, trees. Some of them snapped near the top and pulled down. And you don't know how in the world it got snapped at the top, but then there'd be two or three of them like that. And they'd be pulled down in such a way to form perfect X's or angles of A's and things like that or X's. Interesting. I mean, um, it looks like a city of geometric patterns. Now, that doesn't happen naturally. So this (laughs) is just one of our hot areas, that uh, hot spot areas that we're continuing to look at of course this time of year it's going to be harder to get to it's normally a summertime thing that we do oh, we go wow. over there yeah it's going to start getting really cold i have you noticed compared to the last couple of years uh, it's getting colder sooner oh yeah i don't know what's going on uh, as you know we had snow up here first part of october and i haven't seen that in a long time we actually had like hailstones coming down small ones so of the mountain, Crystal Mountain, which is up a bit higher than where we're at. We're at about the 1,700-foot level. Crystal Mountain is near that area. It's about three, two, three, four thousand 4,000-foot and up. And they're getting a lot of snow, especially when we had this, what, the rain that came this whole last week. It was wet, like you can't believe, but up there it would translate into a ton of snow. And the pass is closed already, so... It can't get over to Yakima and over to Chinook Pass. So that's usually when this area gets to be a dead end, unless you want to go to the ski resort. Yeah, that's about all you could go up to there. You know, I, yeah, when I was a kid, there used to be a whole bunch of businesses on that road, you know, going up there. And they're all long gone. We had a number of restaurants in the Greenwater area at one time. And... And there was a couple other lodges too along the way, but the, yeah, they just disappeared. It's just hard to rebuild these businesses once something's happened. We've had a lot of problems with flooding up around the the couple of rivers that come through here. They change their path and they run and start eating away at the bank at certain places and or in certain areas are too low, and the flooding happens too much. And you know, nobody wants to insure an area that's that low. Whenever there a major flood comes through, oh yeah, I uh, I just remember when I was a kid we used to go up that way, you know, and I remember we stop at different diners for coffee. Well, not me, but you know, my parents, my grandparents, we we go and they would stop and get coffee and and stuff. And then you know, I remember when I got married the first time, I I I'm gonna take my wife on that road. They were all long gone. So, I mean, you know, the things that were there, like in the 50s and early 60s, are, are just history. We still have a couple of places. We have a, a, a couple of sandwich shop, a coffee shop up here, and, of course, the local tavern. But there were a number of other nice restaurants that used to be up around here, but they're long gone. Or they either got flooded out or burnt out. And uh, or one down below has been closed down for a while. It's just that nobody has the money to come up with to, to try to revive the economy for these other businesses that used to be here. Yeah, and, and it's it, again, the time of year has a lot to do with it, too. I mean, let's face it, you, you know, if you're a business trying to survive this time of year there, it's, it'd be impossible. It's tourism. It's, it's all very seasonal. 
And that's the toughest thing for a business to try to endure. I'd much rather have a business that had consistent uh, business all year long, like from the locals or from regular people coming through. But once the pass closes down, then you have a dead zone. And then if you don't really have a lot of locals like we do, it's not it's kind of sparsely populated up here. So you're really not going to get a ton of business that way. No, you wouldn't. I mean, what's the population in your area? Do you know? Well, surprisingly, with green water, for instance, uh, and you got to figure a lot of these homes are part-timers that don't consider themselves as full-time residents here. I'm going to say less than 100 people. And that's just for green water. We have a couple other major residential areas up the way, and I would, I'm not really sure what their populations would be. There's quite a number of homes, but I'd venture to say it's close to only 30 to 40 percent are would be considered full time. And as time goes by, a lot of them are turning their uh, they're buying these homes up and turning them to uh, Airbnbs and things like that, or renting them out. And uh, that number of full time residences continue to go down. Uh, that, that has gotten really popular. People renting their houses out, you know, off oh, season yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, it's a good way to make extra money. But I, I see that. I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I all I can say is the, the economy. And I'm going to just talk about that for a second. For like these areas, the the economy is soft, and people don't realize it because we keep being told that the economy is really strong it isn't the feds are dumping money into it on a daily basis right now and i think they're doing it for a reason because they want us to look good before the election time i, I got a funny feeling after the uh, next election we're going to be in doo-doo i always equate it to the fact that you're they are saying the economy is great supposedly but what's happening to all the retail base does that mean that more store, like Sears stores, J.C. Penney's going being built? No, they're being closed down. All you have to do is listen to the reports of all the different commercial, uh, I mean, retail stores or retail businesses that are losing their stores, and they continue to close down to a point where malls are closing down now because there's no support for them anymore. Once you get the main anchor stores out of there and they go out of business. These places just fold and die. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's happening to a lot of malls up here in the Northwest and across the country. You you lose Sears, you lose J.C. Penney's. You know, uh, what's that uh, uh, bed and whatever that one is? Uh, oh, they sell you know bath uh, not bedroom bed, stuff. Oh, bed bath and beyond. Yeah, they're they're closing up a lot of stores. Uh, I mean, all those things are killing these malls. And and then you sit there, you know, like GM today was saying that uh, they were lied to, that uh, some certain things were promised to them for about, you know, job breaks never happened. They're laying people off. I mean, I think we're going to find out here that the economy is going to be so bad off here in about six months. Yeah, if we don't go into a government shutdown, which I got a funny feeling that might happen because of what's going on right now in D.C. I don't want to sound selfish, but it, as the way things are going and based on the fact that I've worked my entire life and see all the troubles, especially as being an older person getting additional work, it's kind of... Uh, I kind of feel a little bit relieved about eventually going to Social Security in a couple of years. I don't know if that's a, going to be a blessing or it's going to be more of a problem. But, you know, it's, I'm discouraged about the whole workforce situation. I'm kind of like want to bury my hand, head in the sand about it and just lay low and live cheap because that's about the only thing you can do at this point. You're right. Guess what, guys? James? Sam, yeah, we just yeah. burned off another show. Tomorrow, a, who do we have a James on? We have Lon Strickler, and he's going to get into detail about all the uh, cryptid reports around uh, all over. Oh, yeah. That's going to be a great show. Hey, like always, guys, we'll talk to you tomorrow. And everybody out there, make sure you tell your friends about Night Dreams Talk Radio. I revamped the website a little bit today. Check it out. Just type in Night Dreams Talk Radio or www. Night Dreams Talk Radio. Till tomorrow, we're gone. Bye-bye.